May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We are exploring the concept of redemption during this Advent season. And it's how Jesus provides for us by coming to earth and the joy that comes because of a relationship with Jesus. Redemption, we tend to think about at Easter time because we think of the cross and we think of the empty tomb and that's certainly appropriate. But none of that happens without the manger coming first. And so that's what Advent is all about. And we're doing it a little bit differently this year. We're, we're exploring what redemption means by looking at a book or a movie, if that's your way of looking at it, of A Christmas Carol, the uh, story by Charles Dickens from the 1840s. It's a story about Ebenezer Scrooge, who is the absolute miserable miser of a man. He has no surviving friends. He has one living relative, a nephew, who he has kind of shunned. We'll get into why in a minute. And he's not even really all that happy when he's alone with all of his money. This guy has no happiness. As we learned last week, Ebenezer is visited by a ghost, the ghost of his old business partner, Jacob Marley, who's been dead for seven years at this point. And Jacob is here to help him. Jacob's actually there to try to redeem this guy. He tells him, Ebenezer, all those times we weren't helpful for people, all the times we actually hurt people by not standing up for them, we made a chain each time that happened, a chain link. And with this heavy, long chain that's behind me, you had the same size of one when I died seven years ago. You've added to it over the course of time. You need to be redeemed. And I'm here to help you with that. Actually, I'm here to tell you that there are three ghosts that are going to help you with that. So we learn that there's going to be a Christmas past, present, and yet to come. The ghost of Christmas past is the first one, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. When he first arrives, he introduces himself, and Ebenezer says, so you're the ghost of Christmas long past? And he says, oh no, Ebenezer, I'm the ghost of your past. Ebenezer is about to take a trip of memories of things that happened to him, both for better or for worse, during the holiday season. So what are your most vivid Christmas memories? You may remember a few weeks ago I had you fill out a note card and tell me what your favorite memories were. Well, this is what that was all about. And here are some of the things that were the most popular answers. Um, I didn't get any like single answers. Most of you had like duplicates, which was good. It made it easier to put this together. So the first one makes total sense to me in this church is the Festival of Nativities. <laughs> a lot of you really, really ex experienced that and enjoyed it. Candlelight services of different kinds. You all were into that a lot. That, that was one, probably the most, uh, most recognized answer. Christmas carols. Any of you used to go out and sing for people at their doorsteps? I remember as a youth group kid, man, we went to every nursing home in Leavenworth, Kansas and, and sang. Uh, a couple of you mentioned that you really enjoyed seeing Handel's Messiah, uh, which is a big production that a lot of, a lot of uh, places put on during this time of year. Advent wreaths, just like we lit today, the first, those first two candles. Of course, it wouldn't be Christmas without a sweet tooth, right? So Christmas cookies came up a lot. Matter of fact, way more often than we probably all should talk about cookies, <laughs> says the guy up here, okay? Uh, and of course, spending time with our families was a big one that a lot of you mentioned. In our house, Christmas Eve was by far my favorite thing because we did so much on Christmas Eve and it was a time to see a lot of family members. So our Christmas Eve went something like this. Uh, we would all get together and go to church for Christmas Eve service. And I think it was one of the early services, like 5 or 6 p.m., because we would come back home and my grandmother and my mom and my aunt would, create, would have this great meal that they would prepare. And we would, so our big meal was not on Christmas Day, it was on Christmas Eve. But of course, as a kid, the most important thing was we got to open all the presents under the tree on Christmas Eve. That was my mom's thing. And so we would, uh, we would start opening them up. And I tell you what, those are some of my favorite memories because of what I got. And honestly, some of my biggest Christmas disappointments because of what I got. I thought I'd share a couple. So one of my most 
favorite gifts ever was opening up the Millennium Falcon. Y'all remember this from Star Wars? This is like, I think I was like five or six years old when that movie came out, and I remember, that this, I still to this day remember the size of the box and wondering, wow, what's in it? And then when I saw my name on it, I was really, really excited. It was the Millennium Falcon. I still have this in our basement, in a, in a Rubbermaid uh, of my Star Wars toys, because I just can't, it's one of those deals where I think my grandchildren are going to get them at some day. My son played with them when he was younger, but I want to give it to grandkids at some point. Another one was... Squad 51 from the Emergency TV series. Do y'all remember that? It, it, was, uh, it was Johnny and Roy, and they were paramedics in Los Angeles County, and it was a, it was a fire, there was always a fire at the end of that show. But up until then, they did these fun rescue things through the, each episode. Those are two of my absolute favorites. I was so excited when I opened both of those, and I played with them forever. Then there are the not-so-great gifts. I remember one time, I, the, probably the biggest box I ever had under the tree, I was really super excited. I was probably about eight or nine years old. And I remember ripping open the package and opening it up, and it was a coat. <laughs> now, that's a very practical gift. And it was, I remember it was crazy cold that winter, and so I, got, I had this nice new coat that I'm sure I appreciated, but my eight or nine-year-old mind did not. <laughs> but the, the, the real head scratcher of a gift that I ever received to this day. I was 12 or 13 years old. I don't remember which family member got this for me. It was not somebody in our household. Uh, but I opened it up. It was giant. It was really tall, and I'm really excited. I opened it up, and it was a nutcracker. A three-foot-tall nutcracker. It was ridiculous how tall this thing was. But that was, those were probably the two gifts that yeah, I just didn't really get excited about. And then there are those times when we have a blue Christmas um, you know, a little bit of a blue Christmas. Uh, I, was, I was probably 10, somewhere in there. My, my dad had been injured in an, in an accident a few days before Christmas. He was healing pretty well, but Christmas morning he woke up and he had an infection. And so he ended up having to be admitted into the hospital on Christmas Day. I remember that was just a real bummer of a Christmas. And then, as most of you know, my, my mother passed away December 19th of last year. And so my family trying to get together and plan a memorial service at the same time that you're supposed to be having a festive Christmas season got a little tough, uh, tough for us. And yet it's through those ups and downs that form us, right? The joyful memories, even the, even the not so joyful memories, they, they stick with us. Ebenezer's going to have the same problem. When the ghost of Christmas past shows up to him, he takes Ebenezer back in time and he shows him some of his ups. And some of them are crazy high ups. They're, I mean, they're fantastic. Like, you think, why didn't this guy remember these things? And then he has some real lows. And you wonder, why did he hang on to those things? Why did he try to cast those out of his memory? Here are a few. The first one is of him in boarding school. His sister comes to bring him home for the holidays. Apparently he hadn't been home in quite some time, so he was excited to see his sister, who he loved very much. That's what big time up, right? I mean, that's, that's a, we love that. The reason he was there in the first place was a real downer. Ebenezer was blamed by his dad for his mother's death. He, she died in childbirth, like he could have done anything about that. But his father held a grudge, and so he never treated Ebenezer the way that he did his sister. Definitely a downer. And up. Old Ebenezer kind of surprises himself with how happy he is when he sees a memory of old Fezziwig, his old boss. It's, a, it's Christmas Eve, and Fezziwig shuts down the business and has everybody come out, and they have this great big dance party. And the, this is the first time we start to see Ebenezer crack a little bit because the ghost of Christmas past at, just looks at Ebenezer, kind of nudges him, and he says, how much do you think this cost? And Ebenezer says, oh, no more than and whatever the, you know, whatever the shilling or whatever, whatever a small amount is in 1840s England. And as soon as Ebenezer says it, he realizes, wow, that's not much money for a lot of happiness. He starts to reflect a little bit. Another up. That same episode, that same time frame when he's in, having this memory, he remembers proposing to the love of his life and she's saying yes, despite him not having any money. 
so opposite of his current sta uh, status and standard. But she says yes. She's willing to live the life with him, even though he doesn't have anything. He starts to reflect even more about what that means. Then comes a series of downs. His beloved sister dies in childbirth, giving birth to the nephew. Putting Ebenezer into the same boat that his dad put him into. You see, Ebenezer blames his nephew for his sister's death, even though he couldn't have done anything about it. He's very much a hypocrite, right? He's doing the same thing that his dad did to him. And then after that, that's kind of the turning point for Ebenezer. He becomes a very bitter person, very angry at the world. And because of that, his fiance starts to take notice that this is not the man I fell in love with. This guy loves money more than he loves me. He loves his business status more than he loves me. And so Ebenezer has his love of his life break off the engagement. I don't know what Ebenezer is thinking at this point, but I can tell you this. He starts to see what he once was. He starts to understand a little bit of how he got to where he is today. And I wonder if old Ebenezer starts to wonder just a little bit what might have been. How could things have been different? He used to have a sense of purpose. When he was engaged, when he had his sister, he had a sense of purpose. He had a sense of inner peace. He didn't worry about what his dad had done to him because he had these people that he could love. And then that went away. Well, Jesus himself tells us a little bit about a sense of peace. Let's read together here um, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Think about those words for just a second. Good news to the poor. That's the hope that we talked about last week, that things are going to be better. Release to captives. That's the redemption that is available to all of us. Because whether we understand it or not, we may not have bars in front of us, but we are all captive to sin. And let the oppressed be free. That is a sense of peace, of calm, of understanding that things may not be going the way you want them to, but you have a higher power who's watching over you. It's peace of mind, of body, of spirit. Well, if you're poor, or if you're a captive, or if you're blind, if you're oppressed, you don't have a choice but to confront those each and every day. You can't get around them. That's, that's your life. So many of us don't understand at all what those four types of things are because we've never lived them ourselves. And we might think we understand how people live with those things, but really we can't. Not until we've been in their shoes. Well, Scrooge has no choice because he has been in every one of those circumstances that we saw because he lived them. And the ghost of Christmas past has put it right there in front of him. He can't avoid looking in the mirror. He has to confront a troubled past. And every now and then, as you see each of those scenes, when they cut, especially in the movies, when they cut back to old Ebenezer, he starts to have some facial movements and, and, and facial recognition, or not recognition, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Facial... I can't think of the word. There you go. Uh, 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 body language. We'll go with that. He is starting to understand that he doesn't have to be miserable. That he once wasn't miserable. And maybe, just maybe, he can get that back again. He's starting to make progress, old Ebenezer is here. He's a long way from it. We've got two more ghosts to go through before he can finally get it. But he's starting to see some things. Starting to understand. 
Just imagine if old Marley or if uh, the ghost of Christmas past had also shared with him a little bit about Jesus. He might have got it a little bit faster. He might have understood a little better. See, Jesus, when he called his disciples, called people just like Ebenezer, just like you and me. Let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 23. As Jesus walked alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. Continuing on, he saw another set of brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, repairing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease and sickness among the people. Jesus didn't pick the religious leaders. Jesus didn't call the scribes. He didn't call the wealthy. Jesus picked people like you and me. Got to admit that he also picked people like Ebenezer. He picked people who could relate to others on their level. You and I have a much better opportunity to reach out to people who are on the same level as us as if there was some aristocrat that Jesus uh, labeled as the person, right? Jesus knew that these guys had faults. Ebenezer has learned that he's got faults. Until the ghost of Christmas past puts the mirror right in front of his face, Ebenezer just thinks that this is life. Ebenezer's starting to realize that there's more to it. He's not sure how to do it yet. And he's not going to know how to do it for a while. But he's starting to get it. Ebenezer's starting to figure out that there's hope. He's starting to understand that there's peace. Before long, he's going to have put right in front of his face of here's how you love people. And then finally, he's going to learn about joy. But he's got a ways to go yet. Old Ebenezer hasn't quite figured that part out. For some reason, he wants to hang on to his pain. And I don't understand that. Whenever I've had a, a, a down point in life, I've always wanted to try to move past that as fast as I possibly could. But I understand that's not how everybody is either. I have some family members that, nope, they need to kind of hang on to things for a while, and that's okay. Ebenezer's been hanging on to it for way too long, though. He's allowed the fun and happiness of the times that he had with Fezziwig and with the love of his life. They've been overshadowed by bad times, the things he allowed to happen. He couldn't do anything about his sister's life, but he certainly could have changed the relationship he had with the woman that he loved. He's starting to figure out that even though that was painful, that maybe, just maybe, he can fix some things about his life. Ebenezer, for some reason, has chosen to be miserable. Let's not do that. See, for us to grow in grace, we have to offer our past to Jesus. And we have to offer our past in such a way that we're okay with understanding that Jesus went to the cross for us. And we don't have to be miserable if we don't want to be. That doesn't mean we don't have grief. It doesn't mean we don't have challenges. It doesn't, matter. It doesn't mean that we have a, that we're just supposed to ignore when bad things happen to us or to other people. Not at all. It just means that we need to understand that on the other side of that grief, on the other side of that hurdle, when that challenge has been met, there's peace. There's peace because of Jesus Christ. So how could this present be different for you? Are you holding on to anything today? Are you hanging on to something that maybe you just need to release and let go? Learn from Ebenezer. Do what the ghost says, not what Ebenezer does. Because he's still got a little ways to go in this story. How could this present be different for Ebenezer? We're going to find out next week. How can the present be different for you is a question you need to ask yourselves over this next week. Amen.